can't hear me, let me know. I thought I might have to stand, but I guess I don't. First of all, I want to welcome you to the Champlain Monument here in the village of Champlain, New York. Um, I will not be giving you a quiz at the end of this little lecture, so it's all right if you tune out occasionally. I also will be handing out a pamphlet afterwards, so if you want to wait around, and you can each get one. My name is Celine Paquette. I'm historian for the village of Champlain, and I want to tell you a little bit why I became interested in the monument. I was doing some research this past year, and I was reading the volumes of the Lake Champlain Tercenary Commission, 1909-1913, and they're quite thick, about two inches thick. This is a commission that was appointed in 1909 to celebrate the discovery of Lake Champlain in 1609. The two governors of uh, Vermont and New York appointed prominent gentlemen from each state to this commission. And their task was to uh, assist in the historical celebration of that discovery all along the lake. Plattsburgh, Ticonderoga, Crown Point, Isle of Mont, Burlington, plus a, lo a lot of the little small communities. Also, part of what they discuss, a lot of speeches, a lot of letters, a lot of proposals, was a monument to Champlain, where they would put it. One minute it would be Burlington, and the next week seemed to be Crown Point, and then Ticonderoga. They finally decided on Crown Point. In the meantime, remember, this is 1909. I looked at this monument, and it was erected in 1907. And I said, well, that's interesting. Here in this little village of Champlain, why? We had the first one. Who took the initiative for this? Who paid for it? Why here on the grounds of St. Mary's Church? So before I give you the answers to these questions, I would like to tell you a little bit about Champlain himself, Champlain the man. As you can tell by the monument, he was born in Brouage, France in 1567. Brouage is on the southwestern coast of France. It's a, a seaport, it has a stone wall surrounding this little town. It's on the Bay of Biscay, which empties out into the Atlantic. So the men there learn very early the navigational arts and navigational skills. And you can imagine Champlain as a young man listening to the stories of the sailors and uh, all their uh, travels and um, the boats that did cod fishing off the banks of Newfoundland stopped at Brouage for salt. So I'm sure this is where he got his inspiration for his exploration. So very early, he went out to sea to learn navigational skills. We know that he didn't have a lot of formal schooling, because later on, in, in, when you read books about Champlain, he was ridiculed at one point while in fact were not knowing Latin and Greek, which men with formal schooling had. But he did have some schooling because he could read and write and certainly had a lot of native intelligence. Uh, he was very capable of, with map skills and mathematical ability. His, um, after spending a few years at sea, France had a lot of religious conflicts in the 16th century, so he joined the army of King Henry, and he distinguished himself in the army. Here was a man who had great intellect. He was able to uh, organize people and make some very sound decisions. After the war, he um, brought attention to himself because he had distinguished himself during the war. And so the king was aware of him. And his uncle was a very well-known captain who had the ship called the Saint Julien, which he loaned to the Spaniards. The Spaniards were sailing to the West Indies, had been doing this for a few years. So Champlain sailed with them. So his first trip to the New World was with the Spaniards. He went to West Indies, so Mexico, Cuba. First time he saw Native Americans, saw Panama, wrote in his little book that he was suggesting there should be a canal in Panama. Way back at that time, he, had the, he, he saw the need for this. Went back to France and wrote a marvelous little book 62 watercolors and illustrations. So he called attention to himself that this was a man who had good vision and good observation skills. So the King of France let him sail to the New World. 
he, he was a member of the crew. He was not in charge of a ship. It was a small fur trading fleet. And they saw, this was in, um, I don't have my dates here, 1603 perhaps. He came to uh, Newfoundland and they finally came down the St. Lawrence River. And the French had a fur trading fleet or post at Tadoussac, which still exists in the northern St. Lawrence River. They did not have a settlement, just fur trading. They were very friendly with the Indians there. But uh, Champlain, in typical fashion, every time you read that he lands someplace, he takes off and explores. He's gone for a month or two. How would you like to travel with someone like that? <laughs> <laughs> so he did some exploring, and he saw the St. Lawrence Valley and decided that would be a very nice place for French settlements. There were very, it was very fertile land, and would be wonderful farms and th this type of thing. Gotta see where I'm at here. My little story in Champlain. It's very important when I say to you they were, the French were friendly with the Indians because as I go on telling you about Champlain and you'll realize why he ended up on Lake Champlain because of his friendship with the Indians. He came back to, uh, way back to France, wrote another book. By the way, these books have been translated and are available, the translations. They're rare, but they are about, so they are around. He came back to New France a second time. This time they were off the coast of Nova Scotia, and they began their first French settlement in a little island called St. Croix, the St. Croix River, near Maine. It separates the United States from uh, Canada. But again, he took off. He went as far south in 1605 as Boston Harbor, 1605. They had a very rough winter at St. Croix and decided this was a very poor choice for a settlement. So they moved to Port Royal, which is in Nova Scotia they knew as Acadia back then. But then we get to 1608, when he came back to Canada again, he started the settlement in Quebec. That was the first, uh, the, another French settlement. Then in 1609, this friendship with the Indians, the Hurons and the Algonquins counted on their French friends to defeat their enemy, the Iroquois. So Champlain agreed to go down the Richelieu with them got to Lake Champlain for the first time, saw this magnificent lake, and named it after himself. He was so impressed with its beauty. <laughs> we can tell by his writings that he probably stopped at Isle Mont. The books say he was the first European in New York State and in Vermont. So for two weeks, they enjoyed the beauty of Lake Champlain and the Adirondacks, which he writes about. When they got to Crown Point, we're not sure if it's Crown Point or Ticonderoga or somewhere in between, but the, they were spotted by the Iroquois. So the Iroquois and the Hurons positioned themselves for their battle. When here Champlain appears, and this is important because I'll show it to you on the monument, with his arquebus. The Iroquois had never seen this. They had never seen a man in a metal armor, metal uniform and here was an archivist, which he proceeded to shoot immediately and kill three of the Indian chiefs. He was there with only two other Frenchmen, came out of the wood, started shooting at the Iroquois, and needless to say, ran away. That was the end of that battle, which greatly pleased the Hurons and the Algonquins. So there are many more travels. Uh, this is all we know as far as his travel on Lake Champlain. I have a local legend here that uh, Oral Parsons isn't here. Oral Parsons and Lawrence Paquette always accused each other of having met Champlain here in the village. <laughs> but I couldn't verify that rumor. <laughs> I'm in trouble here with my papers. got married. Married a very young gal who did not accompany him back to New France until 1620. When she did, she spent four years with him in Quebec. Four very unhappy years. 
She was very happy to return to France and never came back again, although Fran uh, Champlain came back several times after that. He died on Christmas Day, 1635, as you can see here. Now, back to the questions I posed before on this monument, who to give credit to. There was a priest here in Champlain who came in 1877, Father Alexis Chagnon. Father Chagnon was born in the province of Quebec and became very interested in French Canadians who had settled in the United States. He found them disorganized and losing their national identity and their language throughout New England and um, New York State. So he proceeded to visit them and organize them. And in 1900, the St. Jean-Baptiste Society of America was founded. He was a spiritual advisor for a number of years. Also in Champlain was a very prominent gentleman named Louis Camille Lafontaine, who's buried up in Church Street Cemetery here, right in the middle of the cemetery. Mr. Lafontaine eventually was one of the men named to the Lake Champlain Tercenary Commission by Governor Hughes. So these two gentlemen decided that a monument to Champlain in the village of Champlain was very apropos. So they contacted all their friends in the French Canadian societies throughout the United States and in Canada and raised enough money, and I could not find the sum that was raised, but raised enough money to put up this monument. On July 4th, 1907 was the unveiling, and it was quite a day in Champlain. According to the newspapers, there were about 6,000 people here. In fact, there's a great picture that shows all the people here on the street, which was a dirt street back then. They, they came by trains and motorboats. There weren't too many cars in 1907. Huge celebration. At 11 o'clock, there was a typical high mass. There were over 100 clergy attending. Bishop Gabriel from the Diocese of Augsburg and Bishop Rasko from Montreal were also here. And there was a dinner, and at 2 o'clock, a huge parade, and the unveiling by Bishop Gabriel. Of course, there were a lot of addresses, and in the little booklet that I will give you, you'll see who gave addresses and who they were, very prominent people. Afterwards, there were games and fireworks, and it's written that at 7.30 at night, all the trains headed back. <coughs> so there's special trains. <laughs> now, the monument is white bronze, and was cast by the Monumental Bronze Company of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Champlain is six feet six inches in height and represented at the time he discovered the lake. The base is seven and a half feet square, a total height of 22 feet one inches. Now we'll go around and I can show you the panels and what some of the um, sayings are here, some of the inscriptions. You'll see in the front the seal of the United States, E Pluribus Uno. Yeah. Then you see the panel where you see Champlain pointing to a point of land. He's in a canoe. And then the inscription, as I mentioned before, the 4th of July, in the memory of Samuel de Champlain by the Franco-Americans, born in Brouage, France in 1567, founder of Quebec in 1608, discoverer of Lake Champlain the 6th of July, 1609, died in Quebec in 1635. You want to come on this side, I can... I need the keys to get into the tower. In my purse. This is the Where's seal your purse? of the village of Champlain, incorporated in 1873. This panel here is very important. That was a self-portrait of Cham Champlain put in one of his books. You see him with the archivist, the Hurons on one side, the Iroquois on the other. What this panel does not show clearly are the types of canoes that they had at the time. The Hurons had very sleek canoes made of birch, whereas the Iroquois had very snub-like, clumsy canoes made of elm. In his portrait, you see that quite clearly. But you see him with the archivist and how the Indians are surprised to see this man. Here on the bottom, the inscription says, like our patron, St. John the Baptist, who prepared the way on this continent. Remember, Franco Americans and St. John the Baptist societies throughout the United States that helped pay for this. He was a fervent Christian, intrepid navigator, a man of letters.
letters and the discoverer of the most beautiful lake in America. You want to come around this back part here? This is the seal of the Clinton family after whom our county is named. Sine Labore Neal. Here it says, the salvation of a soul is more important than the conquest of a kingdom. His memory is an inspiration that brings us to the truth, to goodness, and to beauty. On this side is the seal of the state of New York, Excelsior. And then you see a point of land, wooded point of land. And again, there's a repeat of what we had in French on the other side. He valued the salvation of a soul more than the conquest of a kingdom. Behold, a fervent Christian, an intrepid navigator, a man of letters, and discoverer of the gem of the lakes of America. One of the things that we read about Champlain, that he was a fervent Christian, a very good man, a highly principled man. He did not come to the New World to conquer, to pillage, to defeat, to burn, to torture Indians. He wanted to settle, develop farms, Christianize the Indians, treat them fairly. He was very upset on his first visit to the West Indies by what he saw of the treatment of the Indians there by the Spaniards. In fact, he wrote about it in his book and he said, it brought tears to my eyes. This was not his style at all. He never forgot these experiences as he dealt with Indians in New France. He treated them fairly, never harshly or insensitively. He was upset with the Hurons for torturing an Iroquois prisoner and walked away from them until they stopped. He was an explorer, not a conqueror. He had excellent map skills, as I mentioned before. His maps were exceedingly accurate for that time. He had mathematical ability. He was just overall a good man. We should be very proud that our village and our town is named after such a great person. Now, I will answer questions, or I will take questions and research them if I don't have the answer, or I will invite comments from anyone who might have anything to say about the uh, monument. Did they say how the uh, statue got here, by what mode of transportation? That I haven't been able to find. No, no. No, they no. were constructed in uh, Bridgeport. In Bridgeport, Connecticut, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did several pieces to leave, you know? I think so, yes. <coughs> it was assembled yeah, here. It looks like that. Yeah, yeah. Was there ever intended anything to be put on that back panel? I haven't read about that, but I wondered why they left that blank. <laughs> but I think most of us have seen this statue all the time. We've lived in Champlain and we just go by it. In fact, when I was telling people I was researching the statue, someone said, what monument? Where is it? <laughs> we just don't pay any attention to this. And to think we had the first one to Champlain in the United States. Good. Yeah. So it's quite impressive we did that. The first question I always hear is, why is it on church property? That is the big thing. Be because St. John the Baptist right. and yeah. Father Chagnon. And Father Chagnon yeah. was buried in the tomb right there. Yeah. You can each have one, and they are on sale at the library this afternoon for the proce uh, proceeds are to go to the library. So if some of you want to make a donation for this for the library, you're welcome to. But you get one free. If you want any more, you have to buy it at the library. And the proceeds go to them. And there's three dollars up there. Three dollars. There's a fabulous display at the library of old pictures and early Champlain that Bob Ben has set up. So. Uh, you want at the library. Thank you. Yeah. Or give a. You have them free. <laughs> they got them. They got them. But there's no, uh, this one was lame. They didn't have any really wood on there yet. I suppose that's the time for it. Well, I knew, I knew quite a bit about it, but I, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. 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 Yeah.